If you're growing up at the dawn of the 21st century, your life might look a little like this. Take a look around you. History is being made right now. We have a liftoff. Not long ago, the world was astonished by man's first step on the moon. One small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Today, you don't need to be an astronaut to visit outer space. You just need a ticket. Your parents were the first generation to have personal computers, the internet, and cell phones. But you have it all in the palm of your hand. Can you pass the soap? <laughs> These are exciting times. New sources of energy will make the car you drive greener and the air you breathe cleaner. While medical advances could eliminate diseases once thought incurable. Whether you're in a big city, a suburb, or a remote corner of the country, you have a window on the world, and your generation will determine what happens next. I expect great things from each of you. Make us all proud. When Richard Nixon was running for president in 1968, a war was being fought in the jungles of Vietnam. Protesters were filling the streets at home, and many people wished we could go back to a simpler time. Like the 50s. Dig it, daddy -o. In the 1950s, Nixon had served as vice president under Dwight Eisenhower. Nixon's experience made him seem like the perfect choice to restore the peace and prosperity of the Eisenhower years. In 1968, at the height of the war, Nixon pledged to bring an honorable end to the war in Vietnam. And that was an offer America couldn't refuse. Richard Nixon was elected because of the Vietnam War. He promised that he would end it. He, in fact, extended it. Nixon figured a peaceful chat with the North Vietnamese might clear up some misunderstandings. Unfortunately, the North Vietnamese disagreed, and Nixon tried to end the conflict the old-fashioned way. When increased bombings failed to end the war, Nixon got back on the peace train. He negotiated a ceasefire with North Vietnam, ending America's involvement in the war at last. Ending war seemed to be Nixon's special talent. So now he turned his efforts toward the ongoing war against communism. His attempts to end the Cold War sent him out to the two biggest battlefields, China and the USSR. Richard Nixon a lifelong anti-communist, went to what used to be called Red China because his vision extended far enough to realize that it was in the interest of the world, the Chinese and the United States, for China to come out of its uh, self-imposed isolation. Peacemaking may be serious business, but it's not all talks, translators, and state dinners. The game of ping-pong diplomacy was on. When members of the U.S. and Chinese teams visited one another's countries and played a few matches, helping to ease tensions and open talks between their governments. The Soviets weren't invited to the ping-pong party, but they took it with a grain of salt. SALT stood for the Strategic Arms Limitation Treaty, signed by President Nixon and the leader of the Soviet Union, Leonid Brezhnev. The treaty called for the United States and the USSR to stop making nuclear weapons for five years. Great news, all aboard the peace train. Of course, both countries still had a pretty impressive collection of weapons, but Nixon's diplomatic skills had definitely helped thaw the Cold War. Nixon was re-elected in a landslide victory, but just when the stuffy guy in the suit and tie had convinced the world to give peace a chance, along came a little thing called Watergate. Watergate, in which he helped conceal a criminal conspiracy, brought him down. And he's the only president of the United States to have had to resign his office. During the 1972 presidential campaign, five men were caught burglarizing the Democratic Party headquarters in the Watergate office complex. They worked for Nixon and were looking for inside information about the Democrats that could help Nixon win his re-election. This was decidedly unpresidential behavior, and it just got worse. Further investigation by news reporters revealed campaign fraud, illegal wiretapping, and a secret fund to pay people off. Not exactly the kind of thing an honest 50s-style president should be doing. 
The U.S. Senate looked into the accusations, and former staff members testified that audio tapes existed of Nixon planning to cover up the break-in. Bad news for Nixon, since covering up a crime is also a crime. Well, I'm not a crook. I've burned everything I've got. The president fought back against the scandal, but there was only one way to make peace with an angry nation. I have concluded that because of the Watergate matter, I might not have the support of the Congress that I would consider necessary to back the very difficult decisions and carry out the duties of this office in the way the interests of the nation will require. Therefore, I shall resign the presidency effective at noon tomorrow. The president works for the people, and one of the great tragedies of many recent presidents is that they thought they didn't have to tell the truth to the public. And the cover-ups, the concealment, the, the lies, the half-truths have, in the end, presidents who, I believe, wanted to do good wound up destroying themselves. Nixon did a lot of great things as president. He got pretty far on that peace train and was a dedicated public servant. But after the Watergate scandal, he became the first president ever to resign the office. After that, having good feelings about Richard Nixon's presidency became a bit trickier. How do you like me now? Gerald Ford became vice president under Richard Nixon on December 6, 1973. But he wasn't Nixon's first choice for vice president. Hmm. In fact, Nixon had already had a vice president named Spiro Agnew. But Spiro Agnew broke the law, got caught, and had to resign. And Gerald Ford moved up to vice president. Unfortunately, less than a year later came the Watergate scandal where Richard Nixon also broke the law, got caught, and had to resign. This made Gerald Ford our nation's 38th president. Ford became the only man to hold the offices of president and vice president without ever having been elected by the people. I assume the presidency under extraordinary circumstances. This is an hour of history that troubles our minds and hurts our hearts. Gerald Ford thankfully did not break the law and get caught. He stayed in office and was determined to help the nation move past Watergate. So Ford pardoned Nixon for his crimes. And by these presents do grant a full, free, and absolute pardon unto Richard Nixon. Gerald Ford tried to heal the country by pardoning Richard Nixon meaning that Richard Nixon would never have to go to trial for the crimes that he was charged with. Ford had hoped to close the book on Watergate so the nation could move on, but the pardon had the opposite effect. The question was obvious, what kind of justice is this? The man at the top, President Nixon, gets off, gets a pardon, people go to jail. It seemed unfair. It was the middle of the Cold War with the Soviet Union. There were serious economic problems and he had to get Nixon off the front page. Ford's popularity took a dive. Unfortunately, so did the U.S. economy. In spite of all of this, Gerald Ford served the country with integrity. Gerald Ford, a good guy. No one hated or disliked Gerald Ford, and I think history will show that he helped hold the country together after Vietnam and after Watergate in a way that was very beneficial. We were feeling really dirty after the scandal of Watergate, like we needed to take a really long shower. Gerald Ford helped end that dirty feeling. Ford finally ran for president in 1976. I am honored by your nomination, and I accept it. But the American public had lost confidence in the direction of the nation. And so the president who was never elected president was not elected president once again.
Jimmy Carter was a straight-talking outsider who had never worked in Washington. And in 1976, this was a very good thing, because the two presidents before him had caused a lot of people to lose trust in their government. So America elected a humble, honest peanut farmer as their 39th president. As president, he did have some pretty fresh ideas. During a time when America was going through a terrible energy crisis, he encouraged conservation and even put solar panels on the White House. You might say he was our first green president. All of us must learn to waste less energy. Simply by keeping our thermostats, for instance, at 65 degrees in the daytime and 55 degrees at night, we could save half the current shortage of natural gas. Whoa! You're a visionary, Mr. President! Thank you very much. Now, about that energy crisis. The energy crisis was really a huge problem for this country. During the 1970s, we learned that we were dependent on other countries for our oil supplies, and those other countries actually stopped sending us as much oil. Unfortunately, the green president made a suggestion that upset some greenback loving voters. Raising taxes. He proposed a 50 cent a gallon tax on gasoline. He was laughed at. Most people agree today that had we gotten that 50 cent a gallon tax on gasoline to help wean us from foreign oil, we'd be so much better off. Most of Carter's energy reforms were rejected by Congress, and the drive to get America off of foreign oil ran out of gas. America may have thought some of Carter's ideas were nutty, but across the ocean, the green president was working magic with some foreign leaders who were seeing red. Carter's successful diplomacy led the countries of Egypt and Israel to sign a peace treaty, ending their long-time conflict. One of the agreements that President Sadat and Prime Minister Begin are signing tonight is entitled, A Framework for Peace in the Middle East. Menachem Begin, the Israeli Prime Minister, and Anwar al-Sadat, the Egyptian president, actually made the peace. But without Jimmy Carter, the President of the United States, pushing them, bringing them together, it would not have happened. So if Carter could achieve peace in the Middle East, why couldn't he get himself re-elected? President Carter's term was consumed with problems. There was an energy crisis. There was a recession. Lots of people didn't have jobs. Prices were rising. The Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan. A regime in Iran took 55 Americans hostage, then kept them for over a year. It was a difficult time, and a lot of people believe that perhaps the best days of the country were behind it. So Carter may have been an honest president and a hardworking president, but he wasn't a feel-good president. And by the time he left the White House, a lot of people were saying Jimmy Carter had been an ineffective president. He lost the 1980 election to Ronald Reagan, but he still had some fresh roasted ideas like founding the Carter Center in Atlanta, Georgia. Along with his wife, Rosalind, Carter began traveling around the world, promoting democracy and human rights, negotiating peace treaties, and fighting disease. He also helped build houses for the poor with his own hands. For his work both during his presidency and afterwards, he was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 2002. Jimmy Carter may not have been one of our greatest presidents, but he went on to become one of our greatest ex-presidents. And we're not just saying that to butter him up. Our 40th president, Ronald Reagan, was known as a man of action. That's right. Long before stepping onto the political stage, Reagan had a career as a famous Hollywood actor. I guess we can't all have charm and good looks, too. And in 1980, America happily elected this leading man to be their leading man. Ronald Reagan said, you know, I don't see how you could be president of the United States unless you had been an actor. By which he probably meant that co-starring with a chimp helped prepare him for dealing with 
Congress, right? Before becoming president, Ronald Reagan first landed the juicy part of governor of California. He was a runaway blockbuster hit, but he was just warming up for the role of a lifetime. You ain't seen nothing yet. At the age of 69, Reagan defeated Jimmy Carter to become the oldest president ever elected. But just two months after taking office, Reagan was shot and seriously wounded. When he got into the operating room, he looked at the doctors and he said, please tell me you're Republicans. <laughs> Known as the great communicator. If I'm a medical miracle, I'm a happy one. Reagan recovered and got back to communicating with the American people. His conservative message and optimistic tone made people feel better about their government even though Reagan himself didn't actually seem to like government much. Government is not the solution to our problem. Government is the problem. Specifically, Reagan's biggest challenge was with taxes. He had his own ideas about how the economy should work and introduced America to Reaganomics. Reaganomics is the name for the economic policies that were introduced by President Reagan. Before Reagan was president, the richest Americans paid over 60% of their income in taxes. He thought that if you cut taxes, and taxes especially on rich people, but people across the board, that would create a very big incentive for them to work harder. And you could not worry about government deficits, because if they worked harder, they would ultimately pay more taxes and the economy would grow. In his quest to reduce government spending, Reagan cut many social programs, but not as many as he wanted to. And with increased government spending in other areas, the national debt ballooned as the government had to borrow more and more money. Why so much money spent on the military? Well, in this blockbuster, Reagan was loading up for a military showdown with... The Communists. The White House presents the Battle of the Superpowers. Always the star, Reagan got some of the best dialogue, famously calling the Soviet Union the evil empire. Continuing the Hollywood theme, Reagan's missile program was called the Star Wars Defense. He envisioned a space-based system that would destroy incoming nuclear missiles before they could reach the United States. The country spent billions of dollars developing weapons and satellites, forcing the Soviet Union to try and keep up in a big budget arms race. In the end, the Soviets wanted out of the race and ended up negotiating with the United States. So in this international thriller, words proved more powerful than weapons. Ronald Reagan was for smaller government and he was against the Soviets. He made the government smaller, and about eight years after he became president, the Soviet Union ceased to exist. So he was two for two. In a strange plot twist, Reagan and Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev became real-life personal friends. Reagan challenged his new buddy to remove the Berlin Wall, a symbol of communist oppression. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. After Reagan left office, the wall did come down, setting the stage for the end of the Cold War. Reagan's acting experience definitely came in handy during his two dramatic turns as president. And in 1989, he rode off into the sunset, having changed American politics forever. First president, George H.W. Bush, was not the flashiest, most exciting president around, even though this mild-mannered man was once America's top spy? Well, yes, for a year, George Bush was the head of the Central Intelligence Agency. But did you also know that President George Bush was once a teenage fighter pilot? He has lived one of the great American lives. 
He was the youngest bomber pilot in the Navy in World War II. The very youngest one, he's a teenager. Uh, you know, the time when, you know, a lot of teenagers couldn't even drive a car, he was flying a plane and risking his life, and he was even shot down. It was almost a miracle that he survived that war and then went on to be the president. He's a wonderful man. A top spy? A fighter pilot? Certainly exciting. But what George Bush should really be known for is... being the father of our 43rd president, George W. Bush? Well, there is that. But no, he should be known for being a dedicated public servant. Okay, not too flashy, but as a teacher, a congressman, and an ambassador, President Bush spent most of his life serving the public good. And in 1988, George H.W. Bush landed America's top job, becoming our 41st president. During his administration, the Berlin Wall came down, uniting Germany and symbolizing the end of the communist threat to democracy. As the Cold War ended, the US and Russia even stopped pointing nuclear missiles at each other. Well, a few missiles anyway. Meanwhile, in the rest of the world, other conflicts were heating up. In 1990, Iraq's leader Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait. In response, President Bush launched Operation Desert Storm. Iraq must withdraw from Kuwait completely, immediately, and without condition. And force Saddam Hussein out of Kuwait in less than two months. Things were going well for the president's administration, which also saw the landmark passing of the Americans with Disabilities Act, which helped protect our nation's disabled from discrimination. Unfortunately, the economy slid into a recession, taxes were raised, and the only thing people remembered was Bush telling them, Read my lips. No new taxes. No new taxes. Well, there were no new taxes, but he did raise the old ones. And that didn't go over very well with the voters who sent him packing in 1992 at the end of his one term in office. George Herbert Walker Bush, the next president after Reagan, also I think will get pretty good marks from history. He's not gonna be one of our greatest presidents, but he presided over the final dissolution of the Soviet Union. And in the first Gulf War with Saddam Hussein, the now deceased dictator of Iraq, he put together a coalition that did it right. That's right. Throughout his career, George H.W. Bush proved that you didn't need to do it flashy. You just needed to do it right. William Jefferson Clinton, our 42nd president, was a born leader with big brains and a whole lot of charm. When he was just 16, the kid nicknamed Bubba knew he wanted to be a politician. Like JFK, Clinton earned himself lots of love from voters with his megawatt charisma. One of the presidents who's really interesting to meet is Bill Clinton because in person he has this ability to make eye contact, simple thing like eye contact, and he just holds it. It almost creates a gravitational force. When Clinton is focused on you, he really is focused on you, and you sense that. You may not still like him, but you think that's extraordinary. After serving five terms as governor of his home state of Arkansas, Bill Clinton made a run for the White House. In 1992, the nation was in a serious recession. The smooth-talking, small-town candidate from Hope, Arkansas, seemed like someone who could get the country back on track. There is nothing wrong with America that cannot be cured by what is right with America. Clinton took on the tough task of fixing the economy and balancing the federal budget, and succeeded. He revived the country. 
People thought that the economy would, would never really recover. He restored our faith in ourselves. Clinton, when he was president, presided over an economy that grew and generated a lot of jobs and where inequality actually narrowed. He got crime going down instead of up by hiring a bunch of police officers, putting them out on the street. And then he opened up volunteerism. He created AmeriCorps, which was like the Peace Corps for here at home. So Clinton was on a roll, especially when it came to the economy. He signed the North American Free Trade Agreement, or NAFTA, which got rid of economic trade barriers between the US, Canada, and Mexico. He continued making trade agreements in Asia and Europe because Clinton believed this wasn't just about money, it was about globalization. I believe we have made a decision now that will permit us to create an economic order in the world that will promote more growth, more equality, better preservation of the environment, and a greater possibility of world peace. But not everything went so smoothly. First Lady Hillary Rodham Clinton led the fight to create a universal health care system, but it died on the table. President Clinton's attempt to create a universal health care plan failed because the entrenched interests, the insurance companies and people who liked what they had already were not interested in reform. And Bill Clinton couldn't charm his way out of his biggest political battle. His legendary charisma backfired when it was revealed that he'd had an inappropriate relationship with a White House intern. Many people feel his moral values uh, were not ones that express the best in American life. This scandal led to Clinton's impeachment, which led to him being put on trial in front of the Senate. The Senate voted him not guilty of any crime, and he stayed in office. Under Clinton's leadership, the United States enjoyed more peace and financial prosperity than at any time in its history, proving that it was more than charm that kept Mr. Clinton in the White House and helped him finish out his second term as one of our most popular presidents ever. The presidency of George W. Bush just goes to show you there are two sides to every story. Many Americans thought of Bush as the kind of guy you'd want to have a root beer with. Voters saw him as a God-fearing, pro-family regular guy, one who'd understand the needs of the average American. But that was just one side of the story. Bush was a down-home Texan, but he was also part of a wealthy family with a long history in politics. In fact, President number 43, George W. Bush, is the son of President 41, George H. W. Bush. Early in his presidency, seven out of 10 Americans gave the younger Bush two Texas-sized thumbs up. But by the time the two-term Republican left office, 70% of Americans were giving W the big thumbs down. Yet Bush's presidential story started out as a happy one with the passage of the No Child Left Behind Act. This bipartisan effort to boost educational standards across the country came from a guy who wasn't exactly at the head of his class. To the C students, I say, you too can be president of the United States. The new president was quickly put to the test. On September 11, 2001, within months of Bush's inauguration, fanatical members of the terrorist group Al-Qaeda hijacked four U.S. passenger planes and deliberately crashed them, killing over 3,000 people. A shocked nation looked to the president to lead them. Our war on terror begins with Al-Qaeda, but it does not end there. It will not end until every terrorist group of global reach has been found, stopped, and defeated. Terrorism is something that's supposed to destabilize you, make you fearful. I think President Bush's instincts were exactly right to declare war on this 
group on these groups who wished us harm. And it's a constant battle. Terrorists use violence to strike fear in others in order to force acceptance of their ideas. Because terrorist groups exist in many different countries, President Bush had to figure out a new way to fight the war on terror wherever the terrorists were located. The U.S. knew Al-Qaeda was led by a man named Osama bin Laden, and that bin Laden was supported by another fundamentalist Islamic group, the Taliban, which controlled most of Afghanistan. So Afghanistan is where Bush launched his war on terror. I gave Taliban leaders a series of clear and specific demands. Close terrorist training camps, hand over leaders of the Al-Qaeda network, and return all foreign nationals, including American citizens, unjustly detained in your country. None of these demands were met. And now, the Taliban will pay a price. And while troops in Afghanistan searched for bin Laden, the president expanded the war on terror to a new location. My fellow citizens, at this hour, American and coalition forces are in the early stages of military operations to disarm Iraq, to free its people, and to defend the world from grave danger. President Bush's administration had convinced most members of Congress that Iraq's leader, a dictator named Saddam Hussein, was building weapons of mass destruction and funding the 9-11 terrorists. While Bush won congressional support for his decision to invade, there was another important side to the story. No proof of either accusation was ever found. And the war itself went on longer than Mr. Bush expected, right into his second term. There's the president saying, we're winning, absolutely we're winning. Uh, it wasn't true. Meanwhile at home, Bush's leadership was tested by a new crisis involving the economy. Recession hit, banks failed, and many Americans lost their homes. America's money troubles, combined with the increasingly unpopular war, made things hard for President Bush. Many thought he'd made some bad decisions, both at home and abroad. And fewer and fewer Americans wanted to have that root beer with their president. But Bush also had passionate supporters who believed he was keeping America safe in the wake of 9-11. George W. Bush believes history will vindicate his presidency and eventually conclude that his policies kept this country safe after the terrible tragedy on September 11th. Will there be another side to his story? It'll take time to find out. So how about we all sit back, have a root beer, and see what happens next. Our 44th president, Barack Obama, has a lot in common with many of the presidents who came before him, like Andrew Jackson, Martin Van Buren, William Henry Harrison, and Lyndon Johnson. But his election also meant something else for America. Change, change. Change the course of history. Those who tell us that we can't, we will respond with that timeless creed that sums up the spirit of a people. Yes, we can. Obama came from a humble background. I was raised by a single mom who had to work and who struggled at times to pay the bills and wasn't always able to give us the things that other kids had. Like Andrew Jackson before him, he proved that any child could grow up to be president. Tonight, because of what we did on this day, in this election, at this defining moment, change has come to America. The change began with the way Obama gathered support for his campaign. Like William Henry Harrison, he went right to the grassroots. Obama connected with a whole new generation of voters through the technology they used every day, like text messaging and internet videos. Obama seemed to be a dream candidate, inspiring, effective, and even crushworthy.
But running the most powerful country on earth is quite a change from just running for office. Like so many before him, Obama started off his presidency facing some big challenges. President Washington built a new nation after leading the Revolutionary War. President Lincoln abolished slavery and risked everything to reunite the nation. Teddy Roosevelt began the fight to protect our environment. And 20 years later, his cousin FDR led us through the Great Depression and World War II. Hopes were high that Obama would triumph as well. Like Martin Van Buren, Obama's immediate concern was a massive banking crisis. People were losing their jobs, their homes, and their life savings. And the pressure was on for Obama to take action fast. Today, I say to you that the challenges we face are real. They are serious and they are many. They will not be met easily or in a short span of time. But know this, America, they will be met. When we had a, almost a great crash in 2008, he decided to spend money. But his plan cost a lot of money, $787 billion. Let's put it this way. If every student in the United States just split that money evenly, you'd each get about $14,000. So, lunch is on you guys, right? Yeah! He caused uh, the budget deficit to grow, but that put money back in people's pockets. It created more jobs, and that hastened the end of that terrible downslide. Funding the stimulus plan wasn't the only thing emptying the government's pockets. Wars are expensive, and Obama inherited two of them. The United States of America has been involved in not one, but two wars, both the war in Iraq and the war in Afghanistan. And part of the reason President Obama was elected was because he'd been a critic of the war in Iraq from very early on. Uh, and for many Americans, President Obama represented the possibility of the end of that war. So President Obama is faced with the very difficult challenge of trying to bring about an end to these two international conflicts, but at the same time, trying to address exactly those concerns that got us into those conflicts in the first place. Most importantly, American security in the age of terrorism. Meanwhile, the country's health care system was also in critical condition, and Obama pledged to fix it. Like Lyndon Johnson, Obama believed that government could change Americans' lives for the better. And one way is to provide health insurance for millions who are going without. Democrats and Republicans in Congress fought bitterly over a bill Obama had championed. The time for reform is now. There is nothing optional about this law. Vote yes for this bill. We can't afford it. But eventually, a law was passed that intended to help most Americans gain access to health care. As Obama's presidency continued, so did his efforts toward change. But on the way, he faced a lot of familiar obstacles, opposition in Congress, comparisons to his predecessors, and occasionally harsh judgment from the American people. Has Obama become a president to admire, or did he promise more than he could deliver? When we remember the great presidents, we often remember what they did. Uh, and in terms of domestic issues, like health care, like the economy, it's really going to depend. Is he more like Herbert Hoover, who didn't respond during a crisis, or is he more like FDR, who saved the country when it faced a crisis? We know Obama's already learned one important lesson. When you are president of the United States of America, the only thing you can count on is change. isolation. Peacemaking may be serious business, but it's not all talks, translators, and state dinners. The game of ping-pong diplomacy was on. When members of the U.S. and Chinese teams visited one another's countries and played a few matches, helping to ease tensions and open talks between their governments. The Soviets weren't invited to the ping-pong party, but they took it with a grain of salt. 
SALT stood for the Strategic Arms Limitation Treaty, signed by President Nixon and the leader of the Soviet Union, Leonid Brezhnev. The treaty called for the United States and the USSR to stop making nuclear weapons for five years. Great news! All aboard the peace train! Of course, both countries still had a pretty impressive collection of weapons, but Nixon's diplomatic skills had definitely helped thaw the Cold War. Nixon was re-elected in a landslide victory. But just when the stuffy guy in the suit and tie had convinced the world to give peace a chance, along came a little thing called Watergate. Watergate, in which he helped conceal a criminal conspiracy, brought him down. And he's the only president of the United States to have had to resign his office. During the 1972 presidential campaign, Five men were caught burglarizing the Democratic Party headquarters in the Watergate office complex. They worked for Nixon and were looking for inside information about the Democrats that could help Nixon win his re-election. This was decidedly unpresidential behavior, and it just got worse. Further investigation by news reporters revealed campaign fraud, illegal wiretapping, and a secret fund to pay people off. Not exactly the kind of thing an honest 50s-style president should be doing. The U.S. Senate looked into the accusations, and former staff members testified that audio tapes existed of Nixon planning to cover up the break-in. Bad news for Nixon, since covering up a crime is also a crime. Well, I'm not a crook. I've burned everything I've got. The president fought back against the scandal, but there was only one way to make peace with an angry nation. I have concluded that because of the Watergate matter, I might not have the support of the Congress that I would consider necessary to back the very difficult decisions and carry out the duties of this office in the way the interests of the nation will require. Therefore, I shall resign the presidency effective at noon tomorrow. The president works for the people, and one of the great tragedies of many recent presidents is that they thought they didn't have to tell the truth to the public. And the cover-ups, the concealment, the, the lies, the half-truths have, in the end, presidents who, I believe, wanted to do good wound up destroying themselves. Nixon did a lot of time. Like the 50s. Dega Dario. In the 1950s, Nixon had served as vice president under Dwight Eisenhower. Nixon's experience made him seem like the perfect choice to restore the peace and prosperity of the Eisenhower years. In 1968, at the height of the war, Nixon pledged to bring an honorable end to the war in Vietnam. And that was an offer America couldn't refuse. Richard Nixon was elected because of the Vietnam War, he promised that he would end it. He, in fact, extended it. Nixon figured a peaceful chat with the North Vietnamese might clear up some misunderstandings. Unfortunately, the North Vietnamese disagreed, and Nixon tried to end the conflict the old-fashioned way. When increased bombings failed to end the war, Nixon got back on the peace train. He negotiated a ceasefire with North Vietnam, ending America's involvement in the war at last. Ending war seemed to be Nixon's special talent. So now he turned his efforts toward the ongoing war against communism. His attempts to end the Cold War sent him out to the two biggest battlefields, China and the USSR. Richard Nixon, a lifelong anti-communist, went to what used to be called Red China because his vision extended far enough to realize that it was in the interest of the world, the Chinese and the United States, for China to come out of its uh, self-imposed. If you're growing up at the dawn of the 21st century, your life might look a little like this. Take a look around you. History is being made right now. We have a liftoff. Not long ago, the world was astonished by man's first step on the moon. One small step for man, one Today, you don't need to be an astronaut to visit outer space. You just need a ticket. Your parents were the first generation to have personal computers, the internet, and cell phones. But you have it all in the palm of your hand. 
Can you pass the soap? <laughs> These are exciting times. New sources of energy will make the car you drive greener and the air you breathe cleaner. While medical advances could eliminate diseases once thought incurable. Whether you're in a big city, a suburb, or a remote corner of the country, you have a window on the world, and your generation will determine what happens next. I expect great things from each of you. Make us all proud. When Richard Nixon was running for president in 1968, a war was being fought in the jungles of Vietnam. Protesters were filling the streets at home, and many people wished we could go back to a simple lot of great things as president. He got pretty far on that peace train and was a dedicated public servant. But after the Watergate scandal, he became the first president ever to resign the office. After that, having good feelings about Richard Nixon's presidency became a bit trickier. How do you like me now? Gerald Ford became vice president under Richard Nixon on December 6, 1973. But he wasn't Nixon's first choice for vice president. Hmm. In fact, Nixon had already had a vice president named Spiro Agnew. But Spiro Agnew broke the law, got caught, and had to resign. And Gerald Ford moved up to vice president. Unfortunately, less than a year later came the Watergate scandal where Richard Nixon also broke the law, got caught, and had to resign. This made Gerald Ford our nation's 38th president. Ford became the only man to hold the offices of president and vice president without ever having been elected by the people. I assume the presidency 